Hi, everybody, and welcome to this wet felting question and answer, answer session. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicola, Nicola Brown, and I'm a textile artist based here in rural Ireland. I'm a wet felt maker and I'm also an eco printer and I love combining both techniques. And I'm joined tonight by my good friend and my virtual assistant, Shona. And Shona is joining us tonight from Bratislava. Hi, Shona. Hello, everybody. So if you have a question, I'm going to run through the most commonly, commonly asked questions. But if you have a question that you would like to ask me and it has not been covered during this um, conversation, please just write it as a comment and make sure to put three question marks at the beginning and three question marks at the end. And Sean is going to be monitoring the comments and she will be replying and my name will be coming up with the replies, but she's going to highlight everything for me. It's obviously not me typing and talking to you. So I'm going to get straight into everything now. And the questions that I'm going to answer are really applicable to you if you are, or particularly applicable, if you're new to wet felting, if it's something that you've tried and you'd like to get better at, or maybe you haven't started, but you're interested in trying. So the, que the first question really is what exactly is wet felting and what is felt? So felt is a non-woven fabric and it is the oldest known man-made fabric. Felting predates weaving. It predates spinning, weaving, knitting. It's a non-woven fabric. And what that means is when the fibers come together and they form the, the piece of felt, once the felt has been combined, it cannot be pulled apart. So for example, this scarf that I'm wearing, this wet felted scarf, no matter how hard I would pull this, I cannot pull this apart anymore. And if I actually made a hole in this, it wouldn't unravel. Whereas, unfortunately, this morning, I have a nice wool and cashmere jumper, and I managed to get a hole in the jumper, and immediately, or a sweater, for those of you in America, immediately the hole was on the shoulder, and I was starting to get the... Um, knitting was starting to unravel going down the arm. So if you have woven fabric or knitted fabric and you get a hole, the hole gets bigger. But with felt, it's non-woven. And if it's made well, it will never come apart again afterwards. So that's the essence of felt. And if you are wondering what a good project would be to start with as a new wet felter. I would suggest that you start with a piece of flat felt and that you don't get too ambitious. It's a bit like if you're new to cooking, you wouldn't tackle somebody's wedding cake as one of your first or second projects. You might decide to make some scones or some bread or an omelet. You would tackle something easier at the beginning and then when you have some confidence and you understand how the materials work or in the case of cooking how ingredients come together then you would tackle a more complicated project so i would recommend um something in ireland we have sheets of paper we call this a4 i think in america this might be a letter size paper but if you have a layout of your fiber approximately that size, that's a nice size to start with because when it shrinks down, it will be a little bit smaller to finish with. And you can make something like a really nice stand um, to put on your table for a pot, for example. So I recommend not tackling anything too big to start with. And so the things that you need to get Wet felting supplies, you don't actually need that many supplies. 
and you also don't have to spend a lot of money. But there are some basic supplies that you are going to need. And I highly recommend if you are new to wet felting that you try and just start with the correct supplies and only afterwards um, start changing things around. It's important, I think, to have success right from the beginning. So the supplies that you're going to need, you're going to need some fiber. And for most people, that is wool. But I'll talk about fiber in a minute. I recommend that you use some bubble wrap. And the bubble wrap is used to have, it's a little bit like a sandwich. You have one piece of bubble wrap on the bottom. You have your wool or your fiber in the middle and another piece of bubble wrap on top, and then you massage through the layers. And you can also use solar pool cover, but bubble wrap is very, very much easier to use. It's more soft, it's flexible, and that's what I recommend. You're going to need some sort of a soap, and I like to use a gentle olive oil soap, but you can use coconut oil or a palm oil soap, although we're trying not to use as much palm oil from the environmental perspective, but just some sort of a gentle soap. You're going to need water. You're going to need a sprinkler of some description. And I have something called a ball browser. Um, actually, you can't see it in that image. I, I think in another image you'll see it. And it's a specialist sprinkler. But if you're new to wet felting, I would just get a soda bottle or a milk bottle, a plastic milk bottle that, that you, you would be getting regularly from the supermarket. And I would punch a few small holes in the top of the lid and you can use that to sprinkle. Now, some people like to use a trigger spray, you know, the sort of ones that cleaning products have on them, but I don't like that. It hurts the back of my neck. And also I find it's not as efficient as a sprinkler. You need... Um, a towel you might need a pair of scissors but really those are the basic supplies you need and um, so as you can see you can make a sprinkler you can use any soap but i recommend olive oil soap the fiber is the only thing you may not already find easy to get you may not have that at home and you might be asking yourself which fiber is best to start with and when you go online, the easiest thing to do really is to order your wet felting supplies online. And when you go online and you look, you may be confused because there will be roving, there will be tops, there will be bats, there are all sorts of different preparations. All of them are easy to felt with. And I know it's really tempting to want to felt with different wool, but I suggest that you just get some merino when you are starting to felt. It's um, produced in New Zealand and Australia primarily, but also in South Africa, in South America, and it's a very easy fiber to felt with. And if you already have some bubble wrap, maybe you can recycle some from some packaging. If you already have a bar of soap, you have water, you have an old towel, really your only expense starting out is going to be your fiber. So I recommend you start with Merino and it comes in different qualities. I'm not going to really go into that now because I'm going to give you resources that you can use and I'm going to let you know about free videos you can watch of mine, which give you the specifics. But if you're looking for Merino, I would say anything between 18 and 21 micron is what will be the best for you to start with. And then a question that gets, oh my goodness, I get asked this time and time again. People say, oh, my friend, um, they have sheep or, or I have sheep and they've given me a bag of wool and the wool is quite dirty or it's got got grass in it or whatever. Um, can I felt with that? The same with alpaca, maybe with mohair. You can felt with any animal fiber, even dog hair. But I recommend you buy commercially prepared fiber to start with because you will get the 
best results. It is more complicated felting with raw fleece. It's not difficult, but there, it's important to understand the felting process before you start using more difficult fiber. And if you have scraps of fiber, that's another thing. If I'm teaching beginners or when I used to teach abroad, I would go to a workshop and I would give a recommended materials list. And always somebody would come with a big bag of scraps. And what happens if you have fiber from different varieties of sheep? Each fiber has a different micron, which is the thickness of the fiber. Some felts much easier than others. And if you have a mixture and you're trying to mix them together, you are not going to find it easy to make your felt because there will be different shrinkage and some wool may not, may not felt properly at all. So if you have mixed scraps or if you have some of your neighbor's sheep, their fiber, or you have maybe some alpaca, by all means use that as surface embellishments. So embellishments are something that you add on the surface of your felt. So in this case, for example, this, what I'm wearing, this is a yellow um, curly lock. It comes from some sort of a long wool sheep. It was hand dyed by somebody. It's a very acidic color. And I use that as an embellishment on top of my felt. So embellishments are things that you use on the surface of your felt after you have laid out the structure of your piece and they're used to add interest and detail to the surface. So that's where if you have any scraps or if you have any raw fleece or if you have other fiber, if we look at this image of me here, what I have here, I was about to record a full step-by-step -step wet felting video tutorial and I had been deciding which fiber to choose. And I decided to felt with a Portuguese Merino, that's the natural gray fiber. And then I used some orange embellishing fiber and some white on the surface. And here you can see, I've started to lay my felt out. So um, I was using, I'll go back. This is wool roving, but you can also use what are called wool bats. And a bat is more like a big roll of a, it's almost like a blanket. So the fiber is prepared in different ways in the woolen mill. So when it comes from the sheep, it goes to the woolen mill and they initially clean it and they wash it without shocking the wool because they don't want the wool to shrink. And then they depending on the woolen mill, some woolen mills card and then dye. My local woolen mill dyes the fiber and then it cards and it blends it. So carding is when the fiber is combed like this. And when you look on a website to buy wool and you see wool bats, that's when the fiber has not been combed that much. And all the ends of the fiber, it's going in different directions. And it comes like a blanket which you unroll. And it's beautiful to felt with. When you buy roving or wool tops, it's been combed. And then maybe some of the shorter fiber has been removed. And it looks like that long, that, that big um, sort of ball of gray there. That's wool roving. So that has been prepared more than bats. And if you need more information and you want to see how I would lay either of those preparations out, after this video is over, you can check out some of my other YouTube videos about felting. And I share how I would use both of those preparations. And then when you are actually felting, um, the felting process, you lay out layers of fiber at right angles to each other. So in this case, I'm wetting my first layer of fiber here. I've laid out one rectangle of roving in a vertical direction. And then subsequently, I laid a layer in a horizontal direction and a third layer in a vertical direction. And then I embellished. 
And when I had finished um, felting, this is what the piece looked like. So if I go back to the first image, there are the raw materials. And then when I flick through, there is the finished piece. And you can see that full step-by-step -step video tutorial on YouTube. You can felt along with me if you would like to make your first piece of flat felt. Now, many of you, if not all of you, know that I am a passionate eco printer in the dirty pot. And what that means is I like to use leaves, onion skins and bark to create color, pattern and prints on my felt without using chemicals, powder chemicals to fix the color. And for example, this is just one of my scarves. I felted this many years ago. This is a felt scarf. This was actually made um, during a television program where I was doing a um, tutorial for children. So this is a felt scarf that I made and then I printed. And so as an eco printer, I'd like to share a few tips. If you are a wet felt maker or new to wet felting and you would like to eco print, there are a few tips I can give you in relation to the materials that you actually use. So if you are intending to eco print afterwards, I recommend that you use a natural undyed wool when you are felting. Now you could use a pale blue or a baby pink and then you could print on top of it. But if you use a natural undyed fiber, you have the best chance of getting beautifully strong eco prints. And then if you don't choose to use any embellishing fiber, if you felt your piece in white, this is white merino, and then you eco print, there will be no shine on the surface of the piece. It will be very matte looking. The prints will be crisp and clear depending on the vegetation, but there will be no shine on the surface. And then if you want a shine on the surface, such as that scarf that I showed you a minute ago, which I'm wearing there in that photograph, if you choose embellishing fibers that are made from plants, such as bamboo, tencel, or banana, they will stand out a lot more on your finished felt. Whereas if you are working with colored fabric, or colored fiber, and maybe some fabric, I have some silk fabric in this, you can use any sort of embellishing fibers. You can use silk, you can use banana, you can use anything because you're not eco printing afterwards. But if you're intending to eco print, if you choose cellulose fiber, you are going to have a better result when you eco print. And in this image here, you can see that the little uh, sample on the right, the, the little um, wiggly bits of white, those are a cellulose fiber. They're tensile on the surface of the felt. And there's also a shimmer on this felt. And that shimmer is from a man-made fiber called Fire Star. And then the really fun thing is that these two images, these are the same piece of felt. So I was able to print them totally differently on the front and the back. And one is matte. It's not shiny at all. And the other is reflective. So those are just a few tips for you if you are interested in eco printing your felt afterwards. So then another question that I get asked is, is it possible to felt in a small space? And yes, it is. There are some things you can do to make it more easy. But for anybody starting out, if you have a kitchen table or a small table, you will be able to start felting. There is absolutely no problem um, starting felting in a small space. And there is also no problem starting felting if you don't have much time. And um, people definitely wonder um, at the beginning, because, and I know I was really anxious about leaving pieces wet and overnight. You know, do you need to make a piece in one day? Absolutely not. Many bigger projects take weeks or maybe even months to make, 
my biggest project, which I felt it by hand, was a large area rug. And that took me six weeks working every single day to felt that rug. That was a commission. So you definitely um, have no problems just leaving your pieces and then coming back to them. So if you were working in a small space, say you lived in an apartment and you, you know, you were one of a family and you were working maybe on your kitchen table, you can just roll your project up in the bubble wrap and you can wrap it in a towel and you can just put it aside and put it on the ground, put it wherever you want to, and then you can go back to it even weeks later and it won't come to any, any harm. And, um, I have, um, I'm just looking down here. I have a few questions here. So um, if you're interested, then, you know, let's say you've mastered the basics and you might be wondering what's next. Well, Nuno felting is wonderful. Nuno felting is a combination of fabric and fiber, like this scarf here. And then sculptural felting is like um, the first image. Let me just bring it back up again. This here is sculptural felting, or you might choose to make a felt pod that you can hang in the garden for birds to live in. But once you've mastered the basics of actually um, laying out the fiber and got used to what the fiber feels like under your hands when you are felting, you can then choose to do Nuno felting or sculptural felting, all sorts of things. Now, I have got a really good... Um, roadmap and it's got links to my free step-by-step -step video tutorials because if you are new and you are not familiar with my youtube channel you may not realize that this is here and sh that these videos are here and um, by the way if you're enjoying the live stream as well please just hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel afterwards Shona designed this for me. And this really gives you a good step-by-step -step, um, roadmap of how to use some of the videos that I already have there. So if you are totally new to wet felting, I would recommend that you look at the how to wet felt, the step-by-step -step guide, and you felt in time with me. It's a long video, but it goes through everything in real time. And by the end of that, you will see um, you will have your finished piece and the piece that I'm sharing is that particular piece there and I tell you how much fiber I used for it etc etc so you can do that then you might want to make felt cords that's kind of a very simple sculptural project where you end up with cords and cords are really fantastic you can then make different colors within your cord and then you can have sushi style beads or the cord can make a stem of a felt flower. So I have a felt flower tutorial. Uh, if you're interested in sculptural felt, there's a wet felted bangle tutorial, a vessel tutorial, and there's also step-by-step -step Nuno felting tutorial. So there's plenty to get in, uh, you know, to, to look at there to give you um, ideas and to give you help if you are starting out. And I also have some um, books that I am really passionate about. These are, I have many, many felting books, but these are my top three recommendations for new wet felt makers. If you're looking for a comprehensive book with excellent information and some step-by-step -step tutorials for a variety of different projects, flat felt, Nuno felt, and sculptural felt. So these are my top three picks. And the first one there is Felt Making and Wool Magic by Jory Johnson. There's Uniquely Felt by Christine White and Felt to Stitch by Sheila Smith. I love all those books, absolutely all of them. And while I don't want to have favorites, I would say that Felt to Stitch by Sheila Smith is my absolute favorite. Having said that, I love each of them for different reasons and they are really wonderful. You honestly, if you want a felting book, I recommend you buy one of them first because they will have everything you need to know right from the beginning. 
And they also are good for experienced felt makers to go back and dip into. I frequently go back to them as reference books, uh, particularly felt to stitch and felt making and wool magic. And then once you, you've... Um, once you've mastered the basics and you've tried your first things, there's a whole selection of felting books that are excellent for things like uh, bags, scarves, hats, for various, you know, jewelry, felt jewelry, for different actual individual things. I have a whole series of books that I absolutely love. Um, so then a question that often is asked is, how do you care for your felt? And can you wash it and, you know, hang it in strong sunlight? So pieces like this scarf that I'm wearing, or if I have felt wool hangings, I wash them. And I confess, I wash mine in my washing machine on the wool setting with some olive oil soap. But you can also wash them by hand. But I am quite confident. I make sure that during the felting process, and if you watch my step-by-step -step videos, you will see how that's done. I finish my pieces well so that they have got no more shrinking available. So therefore, I can confidently wash them in the machine afterwards and they won't shrink. But if you do have any worries, I would wash them by hand. I always iron them on both sides, even if it's Nuno felt and textured, I always iron it after I've washed it. And then don't hang any textiles at all, whether they're felt or eco printing or commercially bought pieces of felt, like a rug, for example. Nothing should be hung in strong sunlight or light. So that's just, you know, something for all sorts of, fa of um, fabric, not just felt. And then sometimes there could be a disaster. Okay, if there is a disaster, don't worry. Uh, I do have another um, video and it's uh, that orange one, the bottom left-hand side there, transform felt scraps into beautiful beads. And this is something that I learned the hard way. I had a piece that I was hoping to put together years ago for an exhibition. I was working in my studio and it didn't go according to plan. And I confess, I got very annoyed and I cut it up with scissors. And my friend who had taught me felting, Carmen Sanchez Padron, was with me. And she had come up with a solution for my problem, but it was too late. I'd cut my piece up. So anyway, I then discovered uh, in a Dutch book, I think that I had that you could actually put felt in the washing machine and you could um, put it through with maybe denims or, or trainers or something and you could make felt beads. So I now have a tutorial on YouTube about transforming your scraps of felt into beautiful beads. And honestly, it's wonderful. The beads can be used for jewelry. You can use them as buttons. You can use them for decorations at Christmas. There are all sorts of things you can use them for. So I'm going to check now. If you have a question, please just drop it in. Those questions that I have answered, they are all the questions that came into me and the most often asked ones. And in the video description, there will be a link to my newsletter, I have a weekly newsletter and to various, um, you know, my, my social media sites. That's in the video description on YouTube afterwards. If you are interested in having this here as a PDF file where there are links through to the various um, videos, please just join my newsletter list. Send me an email and ask for that. And Shauna and I will send it to you as a PDF so you can click on the links. We'll send you a couple of helpful things about felting. Okay, so I'm going to go and look in the comments now. So Shauna, if there are comments, I hope they are starred. Okay, so Holly is saying here, Holly's across the pond. So she is in England, I would say, or Scotland or Wales. So she has been felting for about six months now. And her question is about keeping water hot by adding more, but not drowning the wool. And she's finding that difficult to do. And I, I'm not sure if you've tuned in, Holly, but for anybody 
coming later on. This video is getting recorded and it will be available afterwards. So you can ask questions later. And as soon as I have a minute, I will answer them for you. So when you are in, when you are actually making your felt, um, you don't want there to be so much water that there is too much um, water and that the fibers are floating around. So if you look, Holly, at my step-by-step -step wet felting tutorial, um, we will drop the link to that also in the video description afterwards. So you've got a link to sign up for the newsletter and then get the PDF if you want, but you've also got a link to the step-by-step -step video tutorial. You will see that I only add enough water to make the fiber moist and to have the soap. It's not spilling out on my table. Um, so if you want to heat your piece up, you can actually put the whole piece of felt in your microwave and heat it if you want it in the bubble wrap. But I would just say you may be using a little bit too much water. So in that case, I would just, I wouldn't try and dab the felt itself when it's very delicate, but I would try and remove some water from the bubble wrap and then I would just add a little more hot water. And I tend to just use hot water from the tap or from my kettle. And then when I am felting, I'll keep a um, maybe a saucepan on the cooker and it just keeps at a nice warm, warm amount. Um, so here is a question from Angry Old Man. I'm not sure who this is, but I absolutely love your YouTube name. So um, they are asking, this is a, a sculptural felting question. So when I was making a bowl, I have a sculptural felting vessel, step-by-step -step making a bowl. And I, you need to make a template or a resist for that. And I use laminate floor underlay it's a sort of foam that goes under a laminate wooden floor and the one that had the shiny um the shiny bit on it i got that in an upcycling center a kind of a cooperative that shiny stuff was just to to give added insulation under the floor but it doesn't have to have the shine on it just some sort of a foam and i have also seen in portugal a craft foam in a big, actually in a Chinese store, but there were these sheets of, of foam. They were about two millimeters thick. And apparently some preschools and, and junior schools would use these for creating craft items with children. So anything that's soft and flexible, but that the water can't go through is suitable to use in the middle of your sculptural felt. Then we have a question about the micron. So as a new wet felt maker, Actually, 21 microns is a good micron for starting to felt. 21 to 24 is good. But if you want to do a scarf, I would be saying 18 or 19 to 21. The, the lower the number, the finer the quality of the merino and the softer it is, or the finer the quality of the wool. It doesn't have to be merino, but the finer the quality of the wool and the softer it is. Um, okay, so anything between 18 and 24 is actually okay as a beginner. Okay, so the next question is coming from Gabriella. Gabriella would like to know if it's possible to make wet pre felt and how. And then she says, Thanks. Thank you, Gabriella. Yes, you just start making flat felt. And it depends what you want to use the pre felt for, Gabriella. So if you wanted it, well, you know yourself what you want it for. So that will determine how many layers of fiber you use to make the pre-felt. So if you used two layers of fiber and it was very light, when you would cut pieces out of the pre-felt to, to include in another piece, it might almost disappear into the background. So you might choose to make the pre-felt with three fine layers. But certainly making pre-felt is very good fun. Um, all you do is you start as if you're making any piece of flat felt. You wait until the fibers are all coming together and the wool is starting to felt. And then you can choose at what stage you, you stop the felting process. And then 
it is considered pre-felt and then you can cut shapes and then you can use it in other projects. I hope that helps. Really great question here. So do you iron when the felt is dry or wet? I always iron when it's damp. So when it's still wet, not when it's dry. I iron it with the steam on the hottest setting of my iron. And then at the edge of the piece, if I need to stretch it, I just give it a bit of steam and I use my hands to pull it. I also have um, pliers that if something is very strong or let's say the edge of um, a bag or something, I can use pliers and I can just really pull the, the felt and stretch it. Another good question. Um, so when I say hang, uh, okay, I didn't mean don't hang your piece to dry. That's not what I meant. I meant in the future, if you have a piece of felt, uh, a wall hanging, for example, and you're putting it on the wall, it shouldn't be hanging opposite strong light or it may fade. But it doesn't matter if it is... Um, it's not that you can't hang your felt to dry it. Yes, you could if you want. Um, if you don't, like, you, you, I would never use a tumble dryer. I would wash my felt either in the washing machine and then I iron it when it comes out or I would wash it by hand and roll it in a towel to get the worst of the water out and then I would, would iron it. Um, so it's only hanging it on a wall so that it doesn't fade in the future. Another great question, what fibers will felt and what fibers will not? So if you think about animals, um, the fiber that will felt usually comes from an animal, always comes from an animal. So we're talking about wool, alpaca, mohair, cashmere, dog hair, human hair, all of those fibers felt, but fiber, that has come from a plant such as cotton or um, banana or pineapple fiber or tencel, which is made from eucalyptus, that will not felt. And that's why the fibers that won't um, felt, they are used to embellish the surface of the piece. So what happens is your wool fibers underneath, you lay your embellishing fibers on top, and then the wool fiber starts to penetrate up through the embellishing fibers. And then as the wool shrinks, it grabs hold of the fiber. So if we look here, this is my finished piece of felt. You can see the white and the orange. The gray is coming through those fibers. This is what those fibers looked like at the beginning. And that's at the end. And the wool has come through that. And... Um, you can see the, the shimmer on the surface. And then if I go to this one here, that white, that crinkly white line is um, the embellishing fibers on the surface of the wool. And the wool has gone through those fibers. And as the wool shrinks, the fiber then crinkles up. So I'm not sure if there are any more questions, but now is the time to ask them. So uh, if you have any final questions, um, please drop them as a comment. Um, okay, Mary has a question. So after a piece has dried, say a bowl, can it be reshaped? And the simple answer, Mary, is yes. So if you're making sculptural felt, you want to shape it, do the final shaping before it's dry, and then it's dry. But if you choose later on to change the shape, what you need to do is you need to saturate the piece. You need to wet it in warm water again. And it might take four or five hours for all that water to penetrate through into the felt. You can add some soap again, and then you can reshape the piece. So in the past, I have on occasion made a, a vessel into a bag. If I wasn't happy with the vessel, I've gone back and I've reshaped it into a bag. But your, the answer is yes, Mary, it can be, um, it can be done. Yes. So there's a question here. Um, Pillar has a question about Nuno felting, if she wants to eco print it. Um, 
So please don't worry, Pillar, your English is excellent. So if you want to um, make a piece of Nuna felt or felt, this is Nuna felt. You, you make the felt, you rinse it, you do the vinegar, the eucalyptus leaves or whatever you are using. And then I boil my pieces for three to five hours, Pillar. This piece here, which was made for the television program, for the children on television, this was boiled for five hours. One hour is not enough for eucalyptus leaves. But yes, you, you just make the felt, so do the vinegar, and then you do the eco printing. And then Wild Mountain Studio, where is a good online source for supplies? I'm not sure where you are, but um, I do have a supplier. I do have some recommended suppliers that I like to use. And if you join my newsletter and you send me an email, I'm happy to send you um, a PDF file with that as, you know, to say thanks for joining the newsletter. Okay. Uh, any other final questions or shall we leave it? Uh, so just to remind you, I do have some very comprehensive step-by-step -step wet felting tutorials on YouTube. So do feel free to um, follow me on YouTube and you can look at those. And I also have some wet felting tips and you know, live streams that, that have got loads more information than today. Today was all about answering your questions. So I've got a tip, for example, about making liquid soap. Or if you're wondering about roving or wool bats, I have a video about that. I have another Q&A session. I have questions for beginners and more experienced people. I have tips about finishing your felt. I have questions, you know, Nuno felting questions. And then I also have a video about the books that I love. So um, I hope that, um, that you have found the answers to some of your top questions. I hope it's been helpful. I'd like to say, Shauna, thank you so much for fielding all those questions for me. And if you're watching this as a recording, please just feel free to ask a question and I will definitely answer it, although it might be a week or two. Sometimes it takes a little while to answer the questions because I, I get many uh, emails as well every day. So thank you all so much and goodbye from Shauna and from me. Bye.